This episode sponsored by Brilliant. Learn to think. Let me tell you about new Caledonian crows. Now, I'm not talking about the old Caledonian crows. Those ones were idiots. No, the new Caledonian crows live on a group of islands called New Caledonia. Oh, must be named after the crows. One thing that New Caledonia has plenty of is wood, but what they don't have is woodpeckers. And that means there are plenty of insects and insects larvae living in that wood that have not been pecked. And these are perfectly good snacks for a bird that might have at them. However, for the crow, the girth of their beakedness, as well as a distaste for smashing their heads repeatedly into things, has no doubt driven them into a certain cleverness. New Caledonian crows may not have suitable peckers, but what they do have is crow sticks. These crows have figured out how to use sticks to fish around for grubs and other things that have burrowed into logs and branches. Now this by itself isn't that much of an achievement. Old Caledonian crows use sticks, but all they did with them was poke each other in the butt. I mean, it was funny. They were voted most fun crow the year they figured that out. Then they all starved to death. Anyway, when they're young, New Caledonian crowlets learn how to make and use sticks from their parents and other adult crows. Here, the one in the middle is the baby, and you can see the adult on the left leave a stick for the young one to take a turn with. But it isn't just about finding the right size dick and sticking it in a hole. These crow sticks are often shaped in a very specific way. I mean, before we even get to sticks, you can see what they do with the leaves of the pandanus. On the right there, you can see a tear started by a crow. But what they're really up to is making these. The one on the left is a sort of basic instrument that takes advantage of the serrated edge of the leaf. The one on the right, though, is made by a different group of crows and is more of a complex Swiss army knife. You got something for any hole. Now these leaf tools are well and good, but if you want to make yourself a crow stick, it's going to depend on what you need it for. Listen, if all you're going to do is poke a spider, and we've all been there, I'm not going to try to sell you a fancy crow stick. All you need is something that puts some distance between you and said spider when you poke it. And listen, you don't need the top of the line stick to hunt for the larvae of wood boring beetles. No, the trick with those is you keep poking them in the head with whatever you got. Eventually they just bite the end of the stick and you can pull them right out. But if you're going after something that doesn't just bite the end of a stick and has wedged itself all up in some tree cranny, I mean, then you need yourself a fancy crow stick. And let me tell you, that's a process. First, you have to cut yourself a little section off a plant. Now, it doesn't look like much, but the location of these first cuts are crucial. And that's because not every crow stick is a straight shaft. Many of them have a hook on the end. One way they make these hooks is first finding a fork in the stem of a plant. From there, you can see this one cuts one of the branches right above the joint. And then the next cut is on the stem right below the joint. All right, this one seems to be having a little trouble with that cut. But here, you can see how those two cuts leave you with roughly a hook shape. There's a more boss way to do it, which this one's demonstrating. You just grab one of the branches above the joint and tug on it really hard. Apparently, if you do it right, you get that hook shape without all the cutting. Anyway, once they've gotten to this point, it's time to clean things up a bit. Remove any extra twigs or leaves that might be in the way. But often these crows will also strip the bark off the business end of that stick. And this might have a couple benefits. First, it makes it smoother so there's less friction when you use it. But it also makes it lighter in color so the crow can see what's going on down in the hole. And seeing what they're doing is quite important for these crows. New Caledonian crows have these large forward-facing eyes. This means there's a greater area of binocular vision where what the right eye and left eye can see overlap. In addition, these crows have beaks that are fairly straight instead of being curved downward. And this means that unlike their close relatives, if they grab a tool with their beak, it will be in the area where they have binocular vision. Now they can hold their crow stick in a few different ways. For a very small hole, they might hold it off to the side. That way you can get at least one eye really close. But what they often do is point it forward, but sort of hold it on one side, bracing the back on their cheek. And having it face forward gives them more options to see what's going on. And this is what the last step in making a crow's dick is all about. The crow bends the shaft so there's a nice curve in it, which helps them keep that hook tip where they can focus on it. And that right there is a damn good crow's dick. And the crows know it too. When they make fine hook tools like that, they don't just leave them around willy-nilly. Here's a camera angle that you don't see all that often, <laughs> outside of pornography and crow research, apparently. Anyway, science hippies put a camera on the bird's tail feathers so they could see how they're using these tools close up. After they use a high value tool, one that they put a little elbow grease into, they hold on to it with their little feet while they eat. But come on, old Caledonian crows could make hooks too, but they would put the hook end in their mouths and pretend they were caught fish. Voted best impression of a fish in Crow Magazine that year. 
and then they all exploded. Jerry, I thought you said they starved to death. Oh, because they were exploded. No, Jerry, not being able to eat because you've been exploded is not a cause of death. It's... never mind. Listen, if you want to get smart like a crow bee, there's a free and easy way to learn about math, science, and computer science on Brilliant. There's thousands of interactive lessons to choose from. You can go for the fundamentals like measurement and how to take complex problems and simplify them into something more manageable. Or you can learn how all that technology around you actually works, from how your data is stored to how your cell phone figures out what location you're at. Brilliant.org does a great job of customizing content to your interests and your skill level. You can go at your own pace, and if you ever get stuck, there's hints and step-by-step -step solutions to get you back on track. If you're curious about programming, try out the course Thinking in Code. It's a fun way to get a feel for how code works, without having to be an expert. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, visit Brilliant.org slash Zayfrank, or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, and you'll be supporting a brand that helps make this show possible. Try Brilliant today. Where were we? Oh, right. Perhaps more impressive than making these tools in the wild to hunt for grubs and such is this crow's ability to use the idea of a hook to solve a new problem. Here there's a bucket of food with a handle on it down a tube. The crow is given a straight metal stick. And watch what it does with it. Bends the metal and then pulls that bucket right out. So I guess the question is, how smart are these little f***ers? And how do you figure out what those little noggins are capable of? I mean, at this rate, they're going to steal all of our tiny buckets. Won't have anything to put your weed in. First off, it's not just all about hooks. They're very good at selecting the right tool for a job, the right length or diameter, and if it's not right, they'll modify it. In this case, it means thinning out a stick so it can be fit through a hole to push a little cup off a ledge. And there you have it, all that work paid off. Now it's time to, oh sh**, that one's the even smarter crow. <laughs> but what about multi-step problems? In this case, the food is pushed way back in that front tube there which comes equipped with a woefully short stick. Betty, that's her name, has to use the short stick to get a medium stick and then a medium stick to get a long stick. And only then, when she's trying to figure out how she ended up in this escape room slash restaurant, can she eat her food. Anyway, straight A's for Betty. Now this crow, Pierre, same challenge, but he tries to skip a step, trying to use the shortest tool to get the longest tool. When that doesn't work, he gets pissed off and flies away, only to come back with a natural stick he found, which is the right size to get the long stick. Honestly, I don't know which one ought to hire. I mean, Betty certainly listens better, but Pierre's got some pluck. But in this one, they can always see all the tools that are available. What happens when they can't? So in this restaurant, the food comes out if you drop a stone into that tube. Luckily, around the corner, there's a stone, but it's pushed way back inside another tube. Keep going and you find basically the same thing, except this time it has a stick in it, also out of reach. This one's a curveball meant to distract the crow. You don't need it, because around the corner, there's a stick lying right in the open. Once it finds that, it knows exactly what to do. Take the stick to the stone and the stone to the food, while it ignores the unnecessary stick-in-a-tube distraction, so it seems like they can keep track of those steps in their head. Kerplunk, nom noms. And they tried this all sorts of different ways, changing the order of things, adding distractions and shortcuts, and the crows were able to hold it all in their heads and come up with the right solution. And if you think these crows are getting a little pissed off having to go through all this hoopla, think again. They seem to get some intrinsic pleasure out of using tools that goes beyond the food reward. After using a tool, they become more optimistic. And this could be a key to why they keep figuring new sh** out. Like if you give them parts that fit together, they can build new compound tools. In this scenario, the sticks they're given are too short. But along with those sticks, there's parts of syringes scattered around. Like the tubes and the plungers. It's like Venice Beach. <laughs> And without being shown, these crows figured out how to put these pieces together to create a long enough tool. But what if they're really just good at sticks and don't really understand cause and effect, for example? One question is whether they can use their smarts to figure out new tools in situations they're not used to. There's an Aesop's fable about a crow that uses pebbles to raise the water level in a pitcher. And New Caledonian crows do seem to learn how to do this to raise a bit of food floating in a tube. Now, to see if the crow really understood what was happening, they tried a few things. For example, giving them a wider tube and then an easier-to-fill narrow tube to see which one they'd go for. They gave him an option of a tube filled with sand, <laughs> I guess to weed out the idiots. Oh, and this one's interesting. They had a setup where one of the outside tubes is connected to a center tube, but out of sight under the table. And the crow had to figure out which tube to put the rocks in. Anyway, the results of all this seemed to be a mixed bag. 
These crows can certainly learn how to use new tools for new goals, but they might just be using trial and error without having a real understanding. So they can do quite a bit solo, what about working together? All right, so you separate two crows, but you put a box thing between them. One crow has to pass a stone under a fence to another crow. That crow then drops the stone into a hole and then they both get food. Not a problem. Now we'll mix it up a bit. In this one, that first crow can make a choice. It can use its stone to get a lower value treat, dog food, or it can pass the stone over to collaborate and get the good stuff. And look at that, they choose the good stuff. Problem is, even if there's no second crow to pass the stone to, they often still try to pass the stone anyways. I mean, f nobody wants to eat dog food. <laughs> Ravens, also in the crow family, can learn to pull on strings together to get treats. And they can learn to wait for each other and have preferences on who they want to collaborate with first. And during all these experiments, you know the crows are studying the people too. And if you're a d to a crow, they'll remember. In this one, for example, the crow is trained to go get a piece of bread and then exchange it for a piece of cheese. But then they introduce a new person who totally reneges on the deal. Look at that, pops the cheese into their own mouth. It's so cold. Anyway, given a choice, even a month later, that crow won't make any more cheese deals with that person. And neither should you. I mean, it makes sense. In the wild, these birds have to navigate some complex social scenes. And that starts with good communication. And they've got good hardware for it. A syrinx, which looks like a failed prototype of a condom. But this is some real deal equipment that lets them do all sorts of things. Communicate with each other, with birds of other species. And listen, members of the crow family are excellent mimics. Can you say, hi? Hi. <coughs> you all right? You all right? So with all these abilities, what are they up to? What are they talking about, right? Well, let's have a look at this charming scene. All right, this one here is Red. She's the dominant female carrion crow in this joint. So she makes a call to this one over here whose code name is Yellow. Yellow responds, has a little head bob, but then listen to Red. All right, the science hippies hadn't heard this sound before, but apparently it's some mafia level shit, because after that, Red and Yellow team up on another bird chasing it around and eventually pinning it on the ground and pecking at it. Another bird, a bystander, is all freaked out and tries to stop it, but unfortunately the next morning the victim is dead. And this happens in the wild too. A dominant crow will recruit others to get rid of the competition. Now when a crow dies or is found dead, it's a whole thing. You're right, Jerry, this one does look exploded. Now in this shot, a science hippie has put a dead preserved crow on the ground. This dead crow is unknown to the local crows, but they all come to check it out. Sometimes it's referred to as a funeral butt brain. Sorry, but brain scans have shown that the part of their brain that lights up is the decision-making part. They're trying to figure out what happened. It's not a funeral. Oh, all right, the, the one seems to be having its way with the corpse. And then there's one doing it with that crow. All right, but anyways, you can see it's not a funeral. I mean, at least not like the kind I've been to. I mean, I'm open to, no, actually I'm not. I mean, it would really change the decision-making around an open casket, wouldn't it? I mean, the old Caledonian crows, they had some funerals. Like the real deal voted best funerals. And then they were all donged to death. Jerry, what does that even mean, donged to death? Will I assume being hit by a dong? Oh, many dongs. No, I'm not challenging you, I just haven't heard of it. Wait, did this also happen after they'd been exploded? Jerry, once something's been exploded, nothing that happens after is the cause of death. No, not even being hit by a dong. Not even a crow's death.